um, around education and equity um, to, the, to the general public. Um, so I'd like to welcome this afternoon Donna Neville. Donna is a community psychologist and educator. She's been involved with a wide range of organizing efforts to further equity and racial justice in our public education system. Um, she's coordinator of the Participatory Action Research Center for Education Organizing. Um, I think the acronym is for sale. And um, they operate in partnership with the Educational Leadership Program at NYU, um, where she also teaches. And so we've got John Donna, thank you for joining us. Um, we also have um, a legend uh, in, I think, uh, uh, and civil, act civil rights activist in, uh, in our presence uh, this afternoon. It's very exciting to welcome Elizabeth horton Shuck. Um, way back in 1989, um, when her son Milo was in fourth grade at Annie Fisher Elementary in Hartford, Connecticut, Elizabeth joined with others and began um, a long and challenging journey to, re to basically redress the inequity between the level of education provided to students in Hartford Public Schools um, and compared to that available in surrounding suburban districts. Um, and that effort known around the state of Connecticut and throughout the U.S. as Chef versus O'Neill, is one of the most successful landmark lawsuits that challenged not only the disparities in educational opportunity for all children, but confronted the long-term effects born from poverty, concentration, and racial isolation. So thank you for joining us, um, Elizabeth. And um, last but not least, I'm very pleased to, to welcome Martha McCoy. Martha is the Executive Director of Everyday Democracy and President of the Paul Eicher, is it Eicher? Eicher, Eicher Foundation. And under Martha's leadership, Everyday Democracy has become known as a national organization that supports cross-sector groups in engaging all kinds of people in talking and working together to create more equitable communities. Um, the organization collaborates with local, regional, and national innovators who are connecting public dialogue to community change and governance, and who are committed to incorporating principles of racial and economic inclusion. Um, so I, I really am very um, privileged uh, to, to uh, have the opportunity to welcome our panelists. Um, and what we thought we would do, let me first of all share some information with you. Um, we have some, uh, some, some a, a document sort of explaining some of the work of everyday democracy. I'm going to pass that around. And I will also pass our workshop sign-in sheet around. Uh, you can um, take the Oh, okay, sorry. Can you take it from you? Um, do you need a flip chart? Well, I had a uh, Really? Okay. We'll, we'll grab some start. What we wanted to do, to do uh, this afternoon is not really uh, do a lecture format, but like I said, I'm going to sort of embrace my inner Oprah and really just try to facilitate kind of um, a working conversation for us to give you a chance to share some of um, the challenges and successes that you've experienced and to give our panelists a platform to share with you um, some of their more su successful strategies in reaching out and engaging communities um, and educating our public about the importance of um, these the equity issues in education. Um, So what I thought I would do uh, to begin is ask you um, to help us um, articulate the reasons why you selected this session um, this afternoon, and um, not to necessarily put you on the spot and force you to admit that you didn't participate in the online survey, survey and you got <laughs> shut out of the popular <laughs> session. Um, but I, I hope that uh, we could um, really invite you to, to, to reflect on kind of what you want in the conversation so that we can also be more directive um, in our comments um, and our, and our um, responses to you. So does anyone want to begin? Please. Um, my name is Mara. I'm a mother of four children in the Hartford area. We live in the suburbs, but we have girls and kids in our kids in our schools and kindergarten. But I'm here to hear a little bit of the case. Thank you. 
professor, but I also work with a group called American Knowledge Institute, which is a social science consortium, trying to bring people together to figure out how to talk about the issues that we've always cared about in a new way, because I was a OEF lawyer for a long time, and frankly, the specific reason I'm here is that we're working on mostly around Fisher. Right. And I'm really interested to hear how people doing local and you know, K through 12 education, because that's such a contested, hard, challenging fight. How do you figure out ways to talk about it that moves people? Because I think, you know, as a lawyer and as a you know, social scientist, we can be way abstracted and up yes. here. And that's not working. Yeah. So I'm hoping that in the panel from others who can hold tools, but I'm really excited to hear about people's successful advocacy and language. Great. I appreciate that. And maybe before um, I invite the, the rest of you to come and share, if I could just do a quick survey and, and ask you to raise your hand if you are a lawyer, um, that would be helpful for us. Great. And um, are there researchers in the room? And do we have um, sort of um, those who are affiliated with or participate in sort of advocacy groups, more general advocacy groups? Great. And do we have parents? Um, and are there uh, others in the room who I have failed to sort of uh, capture by my, yes? I'm with Elizabeth's group, but I'm also um, communications director, so oh, my job is to, you know, Great. frame that messaging and also be able to get it out. Great. A school-based person running a charter school here in the District of Columbia. Oh, that's fantastic. Thank you. You're welcome. Yes? Um, I'm Ed Williams. I'm uh, Psychotherapist and an independent and criminal justice and forensic specialist. Great, thank you. Yes, and the students of management school all my life. Fantastic. Yes. Great. I mean, I think that I, I appreciate it. Yes. Uh, the executive director of the Volunteer Industry Choice Corporation, St. Louis. Great. I welcome all of you. Thank you um, for choosing this session. I think that I just wanted to. Yeah. Part of the session that caught my attention in the title is effectively conveying our messages yeah. and then also building genuine and long-lasting community support for the program yeah. because the situation that we're in is 2013-14 under the current guidelines of our program. It's the last year that we'll be able to accept new students um, from the city uh, out to the various county districts in the St. Louis metropolitan area. Mm -hmm. So we're um, I'm working together with the superintendents to advocate for a five-year extension of the program, and in general, they're supportive of that, uh, but sometimes they get pushed back from their local communities um, regarding whether or not they should continue, whether or not the financial support that we provide is sufficient, you know, questioning, you know, the benefits of diversity, all of those issues. So I think um, I'm going to be at a board meeting next week, so I'm looking for some good ideas on, on how to do that. from 
um, this morning, panel presentations often, and also here, um, just in, in, in our initial comments about what we're hoping to get from today's session that I think are, are really going to inform our discussion. And one of the things that struck me, even from um, sort of the two panel presentations um, that launched off our conference today, is sort of how um, some of the um, sort of reform conversations around choice and um, creating more, more parent choice and parent options creates or highlights this tension with some of our priorities around um, the value of perfectly integrated and diverse schools. And think of how we can flip that and how much power um, there is if we engage our communities and our broader communities, not just our, our parents of color and um, our disadvantaged communities. So how do we um, convey the message that diverse and integrated learning environments are critical to okay. all of us? Um, and what if it's the parent community um, as a whole that's demanding that? If, that if, if they're the ones that say, this is our choice and this is our priority, and we want, um, I mean, I think that I really appreciate this point because I think that as lawyers, we're sort of overly, hyperly focused on the legal cost and, and sort of how we can change <coughs> policy or law um, to prioritize this issue when there really is a, a sort of an untapped um, strength in um, the communities uh, that live with these issues day after day um, that we are less sophisticated, I think, in understanding and in realizing. So maybe um, what I'd like to do is give our panelists just a few minutes um, to, to address some of the, the points that, that we've asked them to think about um, in, in order to frame our, our discussion this afternoon, sort of de how do we develop strong collective understanding of some of these larger political and social dynamics behind school reform? Um, also, how do we build awareness um, of both the educational and the social benefits of integration? And then how do we really make sure that we are successful in involving and, and engaging our parents, students, and community um, as partners in this process so that these efforts are sustained. Um, we don't, the goal is not to, to have the court order in place that you know, mandates diversity and integrated learning environments in perpetuity. It, it should be a value that our communities um, uphold and that we pursue um, beyond the life of, of court involvement, etc. So why don't we begin um, if you don't mind, uh, Donna, um, do you want to start off? Um, yeah. yeah. So the, the group that I'm going to share with you a little bit about that I've been most closely part of and connected to is um, it's the Parent Leadership Project, which is a collaboration between the Center for Immigrant Families in New York City, a center that's um, mostly low-income immigrant women of color, and community members such as myself who have been part of the community schools and, and with together with a Head Start Center, the Bloomingdale Family Program, where many of us, um, our children, have gone to the uh, Head Start Center together and have continued through the schools together. Um, our district, which is uh, District 3 in Manhattan, is about 75% students of color, largely low income, and 25% uh, middle upper income, mostly white uh, families. Um, yet many of our district schools are 80% um, uh, white and middle class, and some are 90, 98% uh, children of color. Um, the heart of our work uh, is about parents' stories. The work is rooted, talking about, you know, really bring in community, it begins from community. It begins from parents' stories and parents' experiences. Um, our work is rooted in participatory action research, which basically is that who knows better than community members what are the injustices of a system and how they need to be addressed. And so rooted in that, we began to address over a few year period, looking at the mechanisms of exclusion, because we started to realize that increasingly um, people would go to our public schools, and these are schools that didn't have testing or any requirements to get in, and we're told a number of things, and the, the mechanisms we identified, just to give you a few, were people being asked how much you can contribute, knowing full well they meant monetary.